Uh, I don't have any slides, uh, being a person who does this a lot, so I, I hope that that's all right with y'all. Um, I've got about 15 minutes, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell, uh, give you a little bit of uh, information about how things went for me, um, and kind of make an unpopular argument for avoiding engineering as a career for this group of people. So I thought long and hard about what can I do that's like totally specific to the audience at HackCon. Um, I was at HackCon 1, it was really, really fun, and I talked about how you can align your interests for sponsors, and it was, it was also just for the HackCon crew. Um, in this case, I want to talk about how many of you, how many of you are currently like interns, or ha have had an intern, okay, a lot of people. How many of those are, were doing engineering internships? Okay, so what I'm going to argue is that doing an engineering internship as your first job, or doing an, engineer, or, uh, an engineering job as your first job out of college might not be uh, the best thing to do. There might be a better way. Um, <clears throat> so first, first of all, I want you to think to yourselves, like, why do you organize your events? All right? Why do you do it? Well, I'm sure there's things like you want to help people learn. You want to improve the community on, on your campus. You want to have other people to talk to. Um, but I would like you to think about it from a career sp perspective as well. You, what you're doing right now, you're already doing it right. Everybody in this room is like perfectly poised to have a really, really successful career once you get out of, get out of college. If you're organizing a hackathon now, you're like so far ahead uh, of the curve. So give yourself a pat on the back for, uh, pat on the back for that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's such a great thing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into my current role and uh, you know, why. So I remember pretty, uh, pretty vividly, actually I have a blog post about this. I haven't blogged in like two years. Uh, but I have a blog post about this from way back when I started that says, um, you know, I went to this conference. It was my first conference I ever went to, and it was DrupalCon. Shout out, Flat World. Um, <laughs> so I went to this conference called DrupalCon. If you're not familiar, Drupal is a CMS. It's a PHP app that basically lets you, you know, put content on the web. It's like WordPress or a blog. Um, and it was a, uh, a developer event, and I, like, looked at the, I sat in the audience, and I looked at the people up on stage, and everybody clapping for them, and like, looking up to them, and I was like, what makes those people different? Like, why, are they, why are they at the front of the room and not me? And I realized that there's actually nothing special about those people. So like I'm up here, but you could just as well be up here, and you already are when you're doing your events. But that's, that's what I, like, I thought. So I was at that conference, I saw it, and I was like, okay, what can I do? How do I get there? Um, and what I started was I started writing a blog. I came back from that conference, and I wrote a, I wrote a blog post. It was like, you know, what I learned at Drupal, DrupalCon, and what, I'm, what my plan is. And like every month, I just made a, made a strong uh, a plan that I would blog every single month, and I, I wrote about stuff. And then I started thinking, like, how can I get up on stage? How can I get somebody to, uh, you know, let me up there? I applied to be a speaker at a couple events, and nobody really cared. I was, you know, I was in university still, and I was applying for CFPs for professional conferences, and it just didn't fly. So I said, well, what's the best thing I can do? I'll just organize a conference myself, and then they will have to listen to me, <laughs> right? So um, I was living in Hong Kong at the time, and I heard about this thing called Open Everything. And if you've ever heard of Barcamp, it's like a similar thing to Barcamp, but focused on uh, taking the principles of open source and applying it to, um, to everything possible. So how can we take open source to education? How can we take open source to uh, you know, our lifestyle, things outside of technology? And it was, you know, it was like Barcamp. People show up, and it's an unconference. You do whatever you want. You, know, you put your name on the board, and you speak. So I organized that. I went out and kind of you know, hustled a little bit to get into, uh, you know, get a venue, get some money. I got my first sponsorship. I thought it was the biggest thing. I'd, like, I was so happy. I got Google as a sponsor, and they gave me the, the large sum of $500. And I ran my entire event on $500, and I thought that was like amazing. It's so much money, right? Like I was totally broke in college. Um, and so I got that money, and I, I bought some pizza, and we had an event, and everybody loved it, right? It was so much fun. But, um, and I got to stand up at the front of the room and talk. So that was, that was like the goal. It was like, okay, if I do it, then, then they'll believe me, right? Like, so I did that, um, had, some more, had some more fun like doing, doing smaller events like that, did open everything. And then I started, um, I, I got to my last year of college and I got a contract job doing Drupal and doing open education. And that's why I worked with John Gottfried. And <laughs> I decided to drop out of college and you know, keep working on this job. Um, and I, I got to a point like after a, a year, year and a half where I was like, I don't really like this job. I want a real developer job. And I was living in New York City at the time. And I applied to a ton of companies. I applied to Newton. I applied to AOL. I applied, I, like, I could list off like 30 different companies in New York City. And I got rejected from all of them. Um, my resume looked good. They got me in. I got an interview. Like, I got a phone screen. But they would like, take me up to the engineering board. I remember really vividly. I was at AOL Ventures. And they said, like, how, do you, how would you implement an um, uh, autocorrect 
spelling uh, in a search engine. So like when somebody types something in, how, do we, how would you implement that? How would you architect the whole system? And you know, I bombed it. It was terrible, right? Like I got up there and I was like, ah, you know, maybe I would like, find some open source library that would do it for me, and then I wouldn't have to know anything. And they didn't like that solution. Um, <laughs> I think that's the right solution still. Um, but anyways, I didn't get any of those jobs and I stumbled by chance upon this uh, job description from Twilio and the thing that caught my eye was like 80% travel. And I, was, I love traveling. So I said, oh, what's this? A developer evangelist? That's a job? I can't believe it. Um, so sure, I applied, I applied for the job. It took me uh, you know, maybe a month or so to go through the whole process. And um, is, this my, is this my timer? Is this accurate? Okay, whatever. So I, I applied for the job, um, and I got it, and <laughs> after being rejected from like 30 different engineering jobs, there's no way in hell anybody's gonna hire me. Finally get, a, get this job at Twilio, and what I learned was that, you know, even if you don't know how to code that well, right, like at that time, I was not a great developer. I had been a computer science student. I had a job as a developer, but like at a really not that great of a company, um, and they still managed to hire me, so I could get out and I could help people who knew less than I did. That didn't mean I have to know everything. Like, you can be an evangelist, you can be a, uh, someone teaching development without knowing all the answers, right? Like, as long as you're a step ahead of the other people, then you can help them. Um, so I got that job and spent a year, a little more than a year, doing, um, you know, the live coding demo thing and going to hackathons. Um, but it was all by accident. Like, I had no intention to go to Twilio and become a develop, developer evangelist. And I think the, the message I want to impart onto you all is that you're all doing exactly the same stuff that I was doing. You're running events because you love doing it. You're getting involved in the community. You're teaching people how to code. And there's this career, which is a developer evangelist or a community, community manager in the developer space that's like perfect for you. And I had no idea that even existed, right? So I would encourage you to you know, consider that path and think about what it looks like. <clears throat> now here's where I, I, make, I take the unpopular opinion and say why you should do this instead of become a developer as your first job. So when I started working at Twilio, I had three buckets of responsibility. One was supporting users, one was making content, and the third was engaging with people. So going out and doing events, um, you know, going on forums, doing all kinds of stuff like that. And I quickly learned that it was my job to be up in the front of the room teaching people how to code. And one of the really, really nice side benefits of that is like I'm up here representing, you know, at the time it was Twilio, but now I'm representing GitHub. And you know, GitHub's a great product, you, know, you, you should all use it. But at the same time, I'm up here and you're learning to have uh, respect or like think, think about me as an authority on the subject, right? And basically the company that you work for as a developer evangelist will pay you to go out and build a network. So it's like a free education. You, you learn about development, you get, a better, you get better at development, you teach people, you get out into the, into the world and you make contacts at every company. You're speaking at public events and when it comes to your next job after that, you'll be so much better off. Like, there will be job offers like piling onto you if you've done this. So really, really consider, you know, maybe that first job you, you take an internship, you do an engineering position, but then when you graduate, go out and find a developer evangelist job, especially this crowd, um, and do that for a year or two. And then maybe move into a product manager role or maybe move into a development role, but you'll build such a great reputation. And many of you already have a great reputation. Like, I'd probably hire most of this room in a minute. Um, so, you know, you're kind of doing that already, but definitely, definitely consider it. So um, the last thing that I, would say, um, that I would say to do is find somebody that you can look up to who's like two steps ahead of you, right? Like find a mentor that's like two steps ahead of you. Don't look for you know, the person who's like five years ahead or 10 years ahead that's already done you know, a ton. Look for somebody who's just a little bit ahead of you and get their, get their advice. You, know, you might not want to go up to them and say, hey, will you be my mentor? Because that's a huge commitment. But if you put effort in and you know, ask them thoughtful questions, I'm sure that they will be really enthusiastic about helping you uh, building your career. So uh, that's pretty much all I had to say on the topic. But depending on how much time we have left, I wanted to have a bit of a Q&A. So yeah, so thanks very much. Let's do some Q&A. Um, I'll also share a really embarrassing story that's relevant, but not about you, not this time, um, about Nick Quinlan, who I don't know where he is, but it's really embarrassing a little bit. So uh, Nick and Swift used to work together as developer evangelists at SendGrid, and they barely overlapped. Swift was leaving the company as Nick joined. I think they overlapped maybe one week. And Nick reaches out to Swift 
uh, who's only you know like a <coughs> couple of years older, and uh, <laughs> he's basically like, hey, like uh, I saw that you were really successful at SendGrid. I want to learn how to be really successful at SendGrid. Can we just have like a weekly call? And Swift was like, well, I don't really know this guy that well. Um, we kind of just met, but he wants to have a weekly call with me for eternity. <laughs> and so Nick just put a call on his calendar, and they had a call every week for like the next three years until we hired him. Uh, and <laughs> so he kind of just appointed Swift as his mentor and uh, forced it onto him. So you could do that too. Where do I sign up for this newsletter? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's uh, take some questions here. Uh, so I was at Metcacks, and Tony from Context.io did a talk about developer evangelism and what it was like. Uh, he mentioned that there's a really high burnout rate, and developer evangelists on average have a turnover of 18 months. Can you comment on how to avoid burnout? Sure. That's a great question. So um, I've been doing this for basically four years with one, a one-year gap in the middle where I was burnt out. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I, I have experience with this. Um, so here's, here's, first of all, props to GitHub because I've been doing this for three years at GitHub and I'm not burnt out, so it's a great place to work. But, um, so I, I had, um, you have to have like a healthy like, work style, right? Like a typical person will work Monday through Friday, nine to five. An evangelist works Monday through Friday, nine to five, and like two weeknights and a weekend, right? And you can't do that, you just can't do it. So if you're doing a weekend event, take off Monday, Tuesday. Like you have to do it every single time, no matter what. Um, and then make sure that you're you know, supported within your team. So if you're a single person you know, covering the entire United States or covering the entire North America, like, that's gonna be really, really hard uh, if you're you know, doing events. So what I would recommend is either scale back your events portion and try and do things that are more like digital online stuff or make a case within your company for an East Coast, West Coast or you know, something like that where there's a little bit of regionality uh, to the work so you can share the load. Um, I think I, I got to the point where it was too late. I was already burnt out. And what I did is I just went off the grid for like a year. Like I, I went, I moved to Europe. Um, I started working in a nonprofit and I basically went into a cave and didn't talk to anybody. So it was, it was really hard. But um, after coming back, I just made a strict rule for myself. I won't work more than like a typical 40 hour week. I might work odd hours, but I make sure that I'm only working like as much as I should. So that's, that's the best thing I can say. I hope that's useful. I think it's okay, actually. I, I don't mind that I was burnt out after the first year. It was really a great experience. Like, just as much as like I was, you know, working really hard to push, you know, to help people like learn how to use Twilio and do all that stuff. I also worked really hard to build my brand and like get to know people and network and like make, uh, you know, make a really good starting point for my career. There's a microphone. So obviously, if uh, there's a rep at a hackathon, they already have. That company already has a dev evangelist, um, <laughs> unless they're like passing it on to another person. Where do companies look for new dev evangelists that we can like try to be at? I'm looking at them right now. This is where I look. Um, hackathon organizers. I mean, if you want to, you know, find jo developer evangelist jobs, it's like I feel like there's a like upward trend in this role. Like it wasn't super popular like four years ago. Um, there were, I mean, people did it. Like you know, Apple had developer evangelists. You know, Google had you know whatever they called them, developer advocates and stuff. But I think like the startup API evangelist type role is like really picking up now. It's it's, it's also a factor of like software as a service. Like API is becoming way more popular. Um, there's APIjobs.com, which one of our coworkers started. Um, there's um, I would also just look at like what are the coolest APIs or the coolest platforms that you know and just start talking to them because I think one of the best things that you can do is as a like relatively junior person, like you don't have a lot of work experience but you do have experience in this industry, you can go to a company and find their head of marketing and say, hey, you guys make a developer platform thing. I think you're missing out on a huge, huge opportunity here. Let me like do that for you. And what I found also is that it's really, you, you don't, you're not gonna have a great success with trying to hire as a company. You're not gonna have great success with trying to hire away somebody who's doing an evangelist job really well because they probably love their job and they probably are getting paid a lot and they're probably really happy and just don't wanna change anything. Um, but if you find somebody like you all who are kind of junior, not, not a lot of work experience, but are really, really hungry, like you're gonna work way harder, you're gonna do way better things, you're gonna be more creative. Um, so just find a company and get them to invest in you. Just make the pitch, say, hey, you know, X company, you could have a developer platform I should be out there doing it, here's why, and then, you know, go from there. Um, yeah. 
Other questions? Shy? Like an AMA, you could ask him like what food he likes. Okay. So what his favorite a... country to live in is. Yeah. Anybody any, else? Any questions over here? Oh, here's one. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just just use the mic. <laughs> How did you end up in Hong Kong? How did I end up in Hong Kong? So I was um, I was a university student, and I went back to um, I went back to my high school, talked to my Spanish teacher, and we were chatting, and he said, uh, you know, one of the things I regret the most about my college career was I never went study abroad. And so I went back to school that week, and I found out the application deadline was like one day later. So I applied, I applied, and I got accepted. I went to Spain first, and then I went to China, uh, and then I went to Hong Kong. Uh, but then I caught the travel bug, and in this time, since in the past four years, um, I haven't had a home, so I basically just travel all the time. Um, but yeah, so I ended up there for a study abroad program. All right. Well, while he's setting up for the next talk, we'll okay. take a couple more questions. Okay. I'll let him set up. Yo. Um, do you see yourself going back to engineering ever, or do you think you're going to stay in, in dev evangelism? So I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, like, um, I was kind of worried about that, um, but then when I came to GitHub, I actually leveled up my engineering skills way more than I've ever, like, done that in any, any job, even as a developer. So I, I, w I worked as a developer for a few years at first, and then I switched, um, and I learned like way more as a developer evangelist because I have to teach people how to do things, and if I want to teach them, I have to learn it on my own. Um, probably, I'm, I'm not looking to change anything. I love my job. Like, I get to hang out with all of you and, and do this kind of stuff, like, you know, whatever. Maybe someday I'll, I'll do engineering as part of starting a company, um, but like, I, do, I still do engineering. Like, I just do engineering for my projects. So for example, like the student developer pack, I did the engineering work for that. Um, but I don't think I'll go back to a job title where I'm like engineer. <laughs>